is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Veronica Mars Season 3, Episode 19, Weevils Wobble, But They Don't Go Down. In this episode, you know, it just occurred to me, this is the penultimate episode of the season, and there's not really an ongoing mystery anymore. So I guess that the finale is just going to be dealing with this sex tape. This is a weird choice. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Ariel for commissioning this episode. Hey, Ariel, if you're out there, what's up? So yeah, I just, uh, I literally didn't think of it until this second, but that, the only thing that we've got that's been sort of ongoing is the election with Keith. And otherwise, is there... Anything else that's going on? I don't think so, right? So this thing with Veronica that gets introduced here, it's a, an odd time to start this mystery. I, I like, does it even count as a mystery? Is it going to... All right, look, I'm getting ahead of myself. But you know how at the beginning of the series, or this season, I should say, I was feeling just disconnected because the mysteries that they've introduced this season have to do with people that I don't know well or care that much about. If they had done a sex tape gets leaked of Veronica, I feel like that would have been a way better ongoing mystery that I would have cared a lot more about. And I'm a little... I'm, I, I, it's just wild to me that they're introducing this, like the episode before the finale. Is this why, oh, you know what I'm just realizing? I was thinking this means that we're going to have to find out who did it next episode, but that's not necessarily true. They may have set it up that this was going to be the mystery for episode, for season four, and then they just didn't get renewed. And that's why people were pushing so hard for a fourth season or movie because they were like, well, you ended it on a pretty fucking serious note there, guys. But I don't know. Um, I'm really curious, though, because like this just didn't feel like a penultimate episode for me. You know, Um, I didn't realize that it even was one until I went on to the menu to find it again so that I could put it on before recording. And then I was like, oh, right. Wow. Um, Usually with this show, especially a penultimate episode, it's you're beginning to see major pieces of the mystery fall into place. And you're either realizing exactly who the murderer is. And I say murderer because that's what it has been up until this season. And usually the final episode is dealing with how to catch them because they're about to do some other fucked up shit right before, you know, to cover their tracks or stop somebody or whatever. So this episode felt really laissez-faire considering what the other seasons of this show have been like. And yeah, thus it just didn't feel like it, it it fell into the pattern at all for me. Um, That said, I actually did really like the episode in and of itself. It's just because of what I'm used to with the arcs that this show normally does. It feels really odd. Um, Tori says, I forgot this is when the tape happens. Yeah, like one more episode to go. I don't... (laughs) If it is that things got like started here and then everybody got angry that the show was canceled, I would completely understand that. And honestly, a part of me sort of hopes that's what it is, because if they decided to introduce this now and then just have the finale be, oh, yeah, we figured out who it was. That's weird. That's a weird thing to do. 
Um, but I don't know. So let's back up. This episode is called Weevil's Wobble, but they don't go down. Obviously, the like seeing the title, I knew it was going to be a Weevil centric episode. The thing that's so funny with Weevil is that we keep having these like these moments of him being targeted and Veronica like consistently doubting his innocence. And it's just really frustrating to watch from the outside because, look, it's not like Weevil hasn't done shitty things. The whole previously on Veronica Mars makes sure to point out to us the things that Weevil has done that are outright murderous or at the very least really shady and definitely illegal. (laughs) For me, illegal is, eh, well, whatever, but shady, (sighs) that's different. Um... And I think that what they were trying to do was maybe paint a little bit of uncertainty in there. I personally really thought for sure, and I don't apologize for this at all. I really thought for sure that the plot was going to wind up being the school didn't want to pay him his workman's comp and they framed him to get him fired so they wouldn't have to pay the workman's comp, which honestly doesn't even feel that far-fetched to me because if you have ever worked a job that didn't want to pay out on workman's comp you know exactly the extraordinary lengths that places will go to to avoid paying out and it's just excruciating um i so yeah i went through a lot of this episode thinking for sure it was going to turn out that the school itself was behind this And that they had made some deal with the students somehow to, like, get credit or I don't know what in exchange for, like, pointing a finger at him. It was a bit over the top, but I wasn't even, like, going to be that mad about it because I feel like when the show does storylines like this, this is what it does best. You know, when they're trying to do social commentary on sort of greater worldwide issues it's best to keep it concentrated with characters that we know. And so dealing with the race issue and the uh, class issue and just overall the privilege issue, I think when you have Weevil as a character, it's he's an easy one to go to pretty repeatedly and have there be issues. We could have had a whole season, you know, dealing with things like that. But because the show decided that they were going to talk about first, we're going to deal with rape really badly. And then we're going to have some odd commentary on like, you know, Muslims and people from Afghanistan, or I don't even know if they were specifically mentioned to be from Afghanistan. I don't remember. But people from Western Asia. um, It's just not their strong suit. And I feel like they have bitten off more than they can chew with those topics. But this sort of thing, like what's happening with Weevil is where this is the sort of stuff that caught my attention with the show in the first place, right? In like season one, they do a lot more about the rich kids at Neptune High versus the lower class kids. And the contrast in being the kid, the child of a fucking literal movie star And being a gangster and trying to, like, make it through on both of those things. And I find that to be compelling. And I think that they went in a great direction initially with it. So I approve of returning to this. It's just a shame that it took this long, you know? Um, And I had said before that I found it really weird about how Weevil was handled this season. Like, he's around, but not really? And I don't know if he was working on something else. I can't remember if we, I I feel like there was a comment section where people were telling me some things. Um, I don't know if he had health issues or what was going on, but Weevil could have been the vehicle for bringing in another character like himself or who was similarly uh, like from an oppressed group, but maybe not necessarily the exact same makeup as him. You know, maybe he's not Hispanic or maybe he's not a gangster, but he has some sort of other struggle. And I I, I feel very like 
frustrated at the fact that Veronica is doubting his word. And I was so glad at one point when she says something specifically like, I assuming you're being framed to which he stops and says, assuming I'm being framed. Okay. If the, if we're not assuming that, then what we're assuming is that I committed the crime and then hired you to investigate myself, which sounds really fucking stupid. So maybe just assume I'm being framed. How about that? And I was just so relieved that he put it in such bald terms because I genuinely was like, Veronica, why would he ask you to step in on this? I mean, the times where Weevil has been involved in setting up a murder, stealing money, he has not denied it. He has never really, like, as far as I remember, lied to Veronica. I think he has refused to tell her anything. But I don't remember him ever outright being like, I didn't do that. He's always just kind of kept his mouth shut if he's guilty. And that's enough for her to know he's guilty. But this whole sense of mistrust that she has here and being like, oh, she she comes in when he calls her uh, when he's still in the cell and she walks in and she's just like, oh, wow, really? So you didn't do this and people just decided to frame you for no reason? I was just like, what is with your attitude, girl? Why do you, why are you like this? And thankfully, he points out because she's like, oh, I guess everybody knows about your history. And he's like, you mean after I did you a favor and came and talked in front of 50 people for your class because you asked me? Oh, I was so glad that he called her out a couple times. Um, Tori says, this was one of the stronger mysteries of the season, so it's like you guys can write, but the season is rough. Weevil and Veronica's friendship is my favorite, but they drop the ball on her friends the most this season. Yeah, and I feel like it's weird because I understand that Veronica is meant to be... She's meant to be cynical. She's meant to be a bit of a skeptic. But it's so frustrating at how they miss... They, they they miss the target on when to deploy her cynicism. I feel like she should know Weevil by now. He's not going to call the most competent private investigator he knows if he's guilty. Why would he do that? And then, like, you know, last episode, they have her being so gung-ho about this guy meeting his long-lost father and really wanting to believe it's genuinely this guy's father and not a, a con artist and they decide to just like sideline her cynicism and have her be, be like this optimistic romantic for that episode. Why? Just because they want the plot to go the way they want the plot to go. They want her to pursue this and they have to sort of change her personality in order for that to work. And with Weevil, I just wish it just, it, it feels like, they're, they're, huh, you know what, I guess, really, because Tori says Weevil and Veronica's friendship is my favorite. I think I'm going to flat out disagree and say Weevil and Veronica's friendship could have been my favorite. It had the most potential. But the writers just don't seem to know how to make her actually be friends with him in a way that feels real. It's like she calls on him when she needs something. And otherwise, if he ever comes to her, he has to prove why he's, like, worthy of her help before she'll do anything. And it's just really annoying to watch this this uneven power play in this relationship where it just feels like at the end of the episode, he asks, like, so reminder, who needs who now? who Or who owes who? And she says, well, you owe me. And he sort of laughs and hangs up. And then we see that he has the machine in his lap that is meant to be able to actually commit the fraud that he was being accused of in the first place. And I suppose this is meant to like cause us perhaps some doubts as to whether or not he's going to stay on the straight and narrow path. Which the thing is, when you're somebody like Weevil, who is an excellent scapegoat, when he is always going to be doubted because of what he looks like and who he used to be, 
there is a feeling of why shouldn't I just be what everybody already thinks anyway? It's easier. It would likely make me more money. So maybe I'll just keep this machine and do the fucking thing because nobody's going to expect that after all that, I actually went ahead and did it anyway. And I can understand being of that frame of mind. I really can. You know, it's just really hard to constantly fight for basic respect. And when you fight for it, what you get is half what you used to get. And the respect that you get is not even the kind that matters to you necessarily, you know? He used to get the respect of a gang, a, a group of people who he saw as peers who had his back. And now he gets like the the diluted respect of white people who are probably real patronizing with it most of the time. And he's getting, I'm guessing, minimum or barely above minimum wage. <sighs> you know, turning back to a life of crime, I'm not mad at him for feeling like he wants to do that. And if the life of crime involves defrauding a college that's likely defrauding most of its students, I'm not mad at that either. It's really hard for me these days to give much of a shit about certain types of crime. You know, if if you're just hurting a massive company and like colleges are fucking for profit, most of most of them, I just I, I really can't work myself up in, into being particularly upset about it. So anyway, the whole thing with this, like, because it starts off, it's sort of like I said, it was surprising because I really thought what it was going to be was that Weevil was going to be set up by the university because they don't want to pay out the workman's comp claim. And I can't even remember what it was that he was doing. But obviously, he injured himself. And the guy who's behind the desk is trying to frame it that maybe he was playing basketball on his lunch break. And that's when he hurt himself and he's just trying to get a payout from his job. This is one of those, ugh, you guys, I have been in this position, not personally, um, but I have had my father trying to get a payout on workman's comp. I have personally been injured on a job and didn't file for workman's comp because it just seemed like more of a headache than it was actually work worth. And I think about that all the time and wish that I had just done it anyway, but they really do they know how to grind you down and make you feel like it's more trouble than it's worth. And if you don't have certain resources, it genuinely is more trouble than it's worth sometimes. Um, so yeah, he was moving a busted washing machine across campus and that's when he did it. And this dude says, says here, you did some time in prison last year. And I, I really appreciated Weevil, so did Martha Stewart. Does that mean I don't get my benefits? No, it just means, how shall I put this? A lot of people look at a thriving private inst institution like Hearst and they see deep pockets. <sighs> you know, like, ew. And they see deep pockets. I mean, you have deep pockets. I'm not like just the kind it's just so gross, the whole thing. And guys, really, I have I over the years, I never really cared about the whole idea of like benefits fraud for your average person. The idea of oh, people are misusing SNAP or WIC welfare benefits. People are misusing unemployment, yada, yada, yada. I always have just been like, well, you know, not that many people. It's not a big deal. And I have just come so far left over the past few years that now I'm just like, oh, are they good? This world is a sham. Capitalism is killing people right and left, destroying human lives. I don't care if people are conning the system. Good. 
I hope more people do it because the system's already stacked against us, and that's literally one of the only means we have of fighting back against it. I wish they'd teach me their secrets so that I could con the system because good for them. Genuinely, I just don't care. And it's just, you know, I just don't. So this whole thing got me so irate right out of the gate. And this is like the first, he says that it's going to take a month for the decision. What am I supposed to do until then? Hop on, hop around on one leg. And he says, just do your best. Uh, You know, and the thing is, likely a workman's comp is going to only pay for coverage for medical bills for the exact injury that you sustained. But if there is ongoing complications that arise because you weren't treated because you couldn't afford it, they're not going to help with that. Or you have to prove that those complications are due to the original injury, which can be hard to do. And it's just, it's all a scam. I'm just, I'm so tired, you guys. I really am. And it's not even me dealing with this shit, really. Um, so we have also a conversation between Veronica and Mac as they are waiting in line to pay for frozen yogurt. There's this moment... <laughs> They're they're waiting to pay and we see this girl get like taken out of line. And as it turns out, this is like one of the first people who gets caught for having a fake university credit card. And I say credit like, you know, university funds card. (laughs) Max says, what's with the food police? And Veronica says she has the right to remain famished. And... Mac looks at her and laughs in this way that's just like, oh my god, really? I like to imagine, because this script is full of lines that like are a little too cute. I feel like for me, that's one of the the major complaints I have about the dialogue in this show, is that people are a little bit too quick and quippy to be believable sometimes. I like to imagine that that line was written with complete sincerity and that she was supposed to deliver it like with a bit of a cool guy attitude and that nobody could take the line fucking seriously. And they finally were just like, all right, you know what? Just make it into a joke. Make the joke how bad that joke is. I stand by that. There is a woman and I'm going to go find her name right now so that I can tell all of you guys so that you all can enjoy the whole thing along with me. There is a woman on TikTok who, let's see, Selena Spooky Boo, C-E-L-I-N-A Spooky Boo, B-O-O. And her whole TikTok is her putting her phone camera somewhere, waiting for her husband to come into the room and then she tells him a really punny joke and he looks so exasperated and she laughs so hard that oftentimes she winds up making this like weird choking sound and that's the whole tiktok is just her telling him these jokes and i swear to god they they the jokes are so bad but her reaction and her delight at the look on his face is so genuine and at first i was like is this staged because how does he not see the, her phone camera sitting there i don't think they are based on his reaction he seems genuinely disgusted a couple times and it's just like oh my god like you imagine that you know one more of these and he's just going to be like i want a divorce And this just gave me those vibes really strong. So Selena Spooky Boo, to all of you who are interested in amazing jokes that are just to give you a little taste of one. My first arrival on her TikTok was her standing at the kitchen stove, boiling a pot of water, and she's just stirring this boiling water. And her husband comes up and is just like, what are you doing? And she says, making holy water. And he says, what? And she says, you have to boil the hell out of it. And she can't even say it without laughing. (laughs) Oh, God. So anyway, this is the first time that we see 
you know, evidence of this fraud being committed with these cards. But also in that scene is Veronica talking to Mac about what the deal is with Piz. And basically she's really frustrated at the fact that Piz isn't more excited for her getting this, this internship that she got. And Mac is like, how about you just let him know that you will also miss him? And Veronica's like, huh? Yeah, I guess I could do that. And I was like, Veronica, literally, why did anybody need to tell you to do that? Like, really? She says there, there's an implication of her just being like, well, what are you so mad about to him or something? And at one point she even says, if Piz wasn't as upset, I'd probably be complaining about that too, that he wasn't like, worried about me being away from him and he wasn't going to be missing me or anything like that. Um, But yeah, just the fact that it hasn't occurred to her that he would like to know that she doesn't want to be away from him, that this is costing her something doesn't mean that she has to give up what her dream is, but just like, you know, I mean, it's, it, it really feels so basic that I'm like, are Veronica, where where's your humanity girl what's happening to you what how is this something that anybody needs to advise you on and of course it can't just be a conversation where she's like hey i want you to know this isn't going to be easy and i am really really going to miss you but we're going to make it work she has to do this really cutesy like calling him from her phone in his room and talking to him as if they are already apart and making it clear how much she misses him in this scenario, you know? And eventually she comes over to him and is just like, um, she, she just does the whole like, oh, do you have any ideas on what I can do about this? Does Do your suggestions involve me getting naked? And that turns out to be the start of the sex tape that begins circulating later. Let's talk about this sex tape because I have no idea what to think. Obviously, Logan is assuming that Piz is the one who circulated it, which I find really strange. Like, I I just don't see assuming that now. And that's not to say that men aren't scum and that if I overheard a girl and her boyfriend's video got sent out that I wouldn't probably also think that it was the boyfriend. Like I'd probably leap to that conclusion because that is often the way it does go down. But knowing Veronica and Piz knows Veronica and Logan knows Veronica, why would Piz think he would be able to get away with it? Like the, the idea that he is that dense to do something so direct and for what reason to just brag that he's fucking Veronica. Everybody knows he's fucking Veronica. He doesn't need to convince anyone. If somebody was like, Hey, Veronica, are you fucking Piz? She'd be like, yeah, I mean, Yes, I am. What? There's no reason to circulate this except to shame her. So the assumption that Logan jumps to that it's Piz, I'm like, that just doesn't make any sense. Piz, there's no advantage to this for him. If anything, it would only make sense that Piz took a video and kept it to himself And because, you know, they're going to be away from each other and he didn't think she'd be comfortable being on film, but he's like, you know what? I want a a sexy video of my girlfriend and I know she wouldn't be cool with it, but I want it for me while we're apart. Not cool at all. I do not endorse it. But that's like a a scenario that I can kind of see. But just the idea of it being emailed to a bunch of people, I don't get it. And so the, the only thing that I can... The only thing that I can think of here, and this is a weird bit, um, (laughs) 
Oh, God, you guys. I'm jumping around a lot. Apologies for that, but I can't help it. There's a whole thing that's going on with Wallace this episode where he notices that there is some dude haunting his steps. And at one point, Wallace tosses something out in the trash in the hallway of his dorm and he sees the guy rifling through the trash and picking out the thing that he wrote. Um, and he talks to Veronica about it and she says something like, well, you know what you should do is basically make a honey trap, a honey pot and write something that he wouldn't be able to resist and leave it for him. And then what he does is because it's in the library, he doubles back to that guy's desk and finds a file. Um, and it's got his schedule in it. Uh, photo one, Wallace has a meeting with, and it's all these photos of him around campus and what he has been doing. Um, and then we see the, his game scores and it says per game. And then advanced they have a dossier on him so he turns around and there's this dude standing right there and wallace starts to be like i don't know what you and he goes Shh. are you familiar with the castle wallace Fennell, i've been authorized to inform you that you've been tapped for admission if you tell anyone, your invitation will be rescinded and there will be consequences. Do you accept? What is this? Have we heard about the castle? Is this something that we know about at all, you guys? Because the only thing that I can think is that this tape is somehow related to Wallace. I don't know why it would be. Perhaps... They put a camera into his room for unrelated reasons and they just happened to catch Veronica and Piz having sex and decided, you know, some asshole was like, oh, nice, and decided to just share it with everybody because they're a dickhead. That said, it feels not necessarily targeted the way that it feels like it is. Like the other the other theory and, and like – why would they be filming Wallace? I don't know what the tower even is. There's a tone to the way that he issues this invitation that makes me think he has been invited to something like the Skull and Bones Society, which is something at, at Yale University. I don't even know if it's like actually a thing anymore. But basically, these sorts of secret societies are like a means of controlling people and fostering weird value systems that can be used to blackmail people later on in the future or have one another's backs when they are doing fucked up stuff because there's a brotherhood. I don't like it. I have no idea what this is. The only other thing that I can think to compare this to, those of you who have seen Community, Troy gets involved to the uh, air conditioning repair school and it's this elaborate, secretive, ridiculous system. And there's just because of the fact that Wallace is so into engineering and the way that he is treated here, it felt so similar to me. Plus, Troy is a black character. He's like the one of the few black characters on the show. And there's that parallel also. And uh, so, yeah, I, I really have no idea what the castle is. If that's like the crew that's involved in, in the fraud, I don't think so. I didn't see this guy amongst them. Did I? I don't think so. Um, it's just a weird thing that I can't imagine what anybody gets out of circulating this video. It just feels like casual cruelty or shaming by somebody who feels a little bit personally Maybe the kids who were involved in the the fraud did this to get back at her somehow. Um, Tori says, yeah, I think it was more them throwing ideas at the wall. Like, hey, elite schools have these clubs. Maybe. I'm just trying to think, like, because that's the only thing that gets introduced here 
other than the sex tape, that it's a weird time to be introducing this. The timing of both of them lining up makes me feel like they have to have something to do with one another, but that's not necessarily true. It just feels that way. And the only other person I could see is Vinny. And frankly, I don't know that this would benefit Vinny that much, but I also don't know what he wouldn't be willing to stoop to. Um, because what happens this episode, at one point, Piz asks if he can, excuse me, my throat, he asks if he can interview Keith on the air because he's going to be interviewing Vinny and he feels like, I just want to give you an opportunity to express your side of things. And Keith accepts the invitation, but the, he doesn't really think about the... <laughs> He doesn't think about how Vinny is willing to pander and how Vinny is just like a much less mature human being overall. And so most of the interview is people being like, Mr. Mars, I have two questions for you. One, why do you suck so hard? And two, how does it feel to suck so hard? Which I can't lie, you guys. I laugh pretty hard at that. Like, it's just such a stupid thing, but it does feel fucking accurate to the experience of being in college sometimes. <laughs> it's just so, so, it's just such a waste of everybody's time, including the person asking the question that you're just like, what do you do? Go get a job. Stop it. Um, however, as much as I know, because the whole thing is like, they're mad at the fact that Keith is cracking down on underage drinking. And the way that Vinny thinks he can pander is to promise that that won't be a concern to him because he's going to be focused on real crime, like murder and terrorism, he even says at one point, which I thought was just so good. And in the moment, it seems like the crowd is really eating it up. You know, like he says this and the reminder that the way for some reason, and I don't know if this is common. Um, I imagine that Carnegie Mellon had a radio station, but I don't remember anything about it, I have to say. But Piz's recording studio has a like an open window into the cafeteria so that people can watch them talking which is a kind of a wild setup. It's the sort of thing that every time I see it in the show, I can't decide if I would love or hate it. I feel like on the one hand, it would be kind of fun to be sort of on stage in a way while you're on the radio. So it feels like there's a little bit more pressure. It's sort of like the difference between me recording when I'm in my office with like just on the phone versus being on camera like I am right now. When I'm on camera, th there's a different energy, you know? And so sometimes you need that. You need something that'll like force you to perform more and brighten your energy. So on that side of things, I'm kind of like, I see the advantage. On the other side, especially at a college, I feel like there's no way to avoid people who are going to try and fuck with you while you're on the air and maybe like write crazy shit and like hold it up against the glass or just do things to distract you. And I think that temptation would just be irresistible to that particular age group. And I know for myself, I'm actually pretty good at ignoring distractions to a point. But if you're with somebody who isn't used to that sort of thing, it can be really tough because they're constantly getting their attention diverted. Um, anyway, there are people standing right outside watching. And when Vinny gives his answer about how he definitely won't, like, the only time after, uh, the only time that I'll worry about bars is after I've already dealt with all of the murder and the terrorism. And then I'll definitely go to those bars and then there's a pause and he says, for a cold one. 
And then all the people out there begin to cheer. And you can see Keith just being like, my God. And I don't blame you, Keith. Like, you're not wrong. Um, but the whole the whole vibe is meant to be, oh, Vinny really, like, figured out a way around Keith's stead good guy attitude and is going to get more votes. But I maintain that you could take that sound bite of Vinny being like, I don't give a shit about underage drinking. And you could play that and it would really fuck him up in other demographics. And how many of these college students actually show up to the polls to vote for sheriff? I have to assume Vinny fucked up on this. If this, if, if we're going to treat this election as if it's anything like real life, Vinny's handling of this would be no good. And especially this day and age, I feel like you could get away with this sort of thing before the internet, before it was so easy to get a recording of the interview and isolate that soundbite. You could probably get away with that. But nowadays, anything you say anywhere, you have to imagine somebody's going to be manipulating that. Somebody's going to be doing something with it. So... Yeah, Vinny, maybe in like 1990, this tactic would work. But nowadays, I don't see it. That said, I don't know how the show is going to handle it. Because the show isn't super, like, realistic in a lot of the ways that it depicts, like, the politics or the involvement of a community in things. So they may choose to have the election be a major focal point in the next episode and have like the campus be somehow mo motivated on it. But uh, I don't know. I just, it all depends on how they decide they want to handle it. Um, and I appreciated that Keith's like sort of, his arrests or his citations, I think is what Vinny calls them. And Veronica's arrests get brought up because as much as like, I want Keith to win. And I think he's obviously the guy for the job, not fucking Vinny. I also do think that we need to acknowledge how many illegal things the two of them have definitely done and that they have really towed the line. And in every case, I have felt that they were justified because I am, the viewer and I'm on their side, but Vinny knows about all of it and there's no way he's not bringing that shit up. You got to, right? Like, so yeah. Anyway, I just really personally was a fan of the mudslinging during the interview. I was here for it. And I'm really, you know, part, well, part of me wants Keith to stay sheriff because he would be, he's a better man. He's better for the job. The whole idea that Vinny is willing to like allow robberies in order to win an election just proves that he's a bad man who should not get this job. That said, I will miss the days where Keith was free to do whatever the fuck he wanted because he was an independent agent and he just, you know, needed to get a particular job done for a certain client. And him being as limited as he is as sheriff that's tough. You know, that's something that you have to figure out a way to work around. And I, so I, I do have sort of mixed feelings on that. And I certainly think if we were going to have gotten a fourth season, which I know we do eventually, but there's a time jump, so it's going to be different. But if we were to get a fourth season and Vinny was going to be the sheriff for that season, that would be hilarious to watch. I mean, you could do so much with the plot line of Vinny as sheriff. And I would be extremely interested to see how that would play out. And especially if we paired up Vinny's now sheriff with an ongoing mystery of the leaked sex tape with Veronica Mars, there are a lot of, there's a lot of ground there that I feel like could be pretty fertile. Um, but, you know, again, I, I do want Keith to win. I just think that if we want an entertainment factor, Vinny is the entertainment factor. The advantage in entertainment of Keith winning is more that now he's going to have to actually want to rein Veronica in. In the past, when he's she's done illegal shit, he's been, like, worried for her, but he's always just 
been a bit complacent about it because he knows it goes with the jobs that she does. And he trusts that she can manage herself to a point. Now he'll be put in the position of it looking like he's covering for her. And that could be damaging to him and, you know, potentially for her as well. So that is something that I I could see them being like, well, we could go down that road. It's less exciting and fun, though. It's less, there's less like, what's the word I want? Potential for comedy in that scenario than there is with, than if Vinny became sheriff. Um, Could Vinny potentially be a deputy? Is that possible? Does he pick who his deputy is? I don't know how that works. I only learned a few years ago that you vote on a sheriff at all. I always thought that being a sheriff was like being police chief, where it was sort of an internal thing and you got a promotion and eventually wound up in that position due to the force deciding that you were finally ready to take on that position. And when I found out that it's a position that gets voted on, I found that really weird. And I stand by that it's sort of a weird thing because like, you know, there was a sort of trust that I had for the police that I obviously don't have anymore. So at the time of thinking, oh, yeah, they choose who their own sheriff is going to be based on the record of how long they've been with the force and how they've done so far. There was a trust that I had like, oh, they're doing their best and they know who's best for the job. Voting for a sheriff is more like it feels like the the fucking plebes are just going to pick their favorite dude to run shit, which just is, it, it feels like such a bad plan. But honestly, it's like the way we do everything else, mostly, you know, we have people vote when they don't know anything about what the fuck is going on for all kinds of other positions. So I can't really like... I I can't explain why it's worse for a sheriff than it is for a congressman or a senator, you know, or a president. Um, I think it's just because those people feel like they feel policy, which feels like less of an immediate threat than somebody who's on the police force. But it's not, that's not actually true. It's just, uh, that's the sort of perception that I have. Anyway, all right, enough about that that election because we don't know what's going on there. Um, so <laughs> there's the whole thing where they're trying to figure out all of the stuff that Weevil touched in the course of the day at work because they keep finding evidence of like Weevil's involvement. Um, Oh, Tori says, honestly, both feel like the same people are deciding the mayor or whoever can pressure within the department and then they can support a campaign. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's a good point. God, our system is just a disaster, isn't it? Like, I understand what we were trying to go for, but we just really like, this is not great. The U.S. is too big. That's the thing. Um. Anyway, so... Yeah, they found Weevil's prints all over a machine that was also in the the empty locker beside his. So they keep on managing to... There's just too much stacking up against him. And there was something that was like underneath a sink that he was asked to come and work on. And she suspects that they put the machine down there so that he had to move it out of the way and that thus was forced to touch it. And a girl comes in and Veronica sees this girl and is like, Oh my God, I love your hair. Do you mind if I take a picture of you for my stylist? And I love Weevil watching her and is just like, what is going on? And Veronica takes a picture And it turns out what she's going for is actually the photo behind her on the wall, which is like a group of people that she winds up being able to piece together as all being involved in the same scheme. Now, the girl whose photo she takes is an actress that's familiar to me, but I couldn't place where I knew her from. Um... If anybody wants to remind me why she looked familiar. I mean, I know that we saw her in that one 
episode where she asks Weevil if he like misses his life of crime. But I feel like there was another thing that we've seen her in. I don't remember, but she looks, she's so painfully thin. Like everybody on this show, obviously, especially if you're a woman, everybody is thin, but she in particular stands out as looking painfully thin on camera, which you know, if you look that skinny on camera, that you must be really skinny in real life. And I just couldn't figure out where else I knew her from. Um, so eventually she, she has tracked down a bunch of people. This one guy who has access to like, uh, the notes on how to like get by the encryption for the cards. He makes this big song and dance about how his notes got stolen and it all feels very convenient. Like in the moment I had a, a bit of a, Oh, maybe, you know, somebody did take his, th-. and then I stopped and I was like, no, he just doesn't want to admit that he has that information. Like, of course. Um, and sure enough, eventually it turns out that all of these kids were engaging in fraud. Veronica figures it out and she sets up a meeting with all of them in which they try to convince her to keep it under her hat. And in exchange, they will give her a university card that has unlimited funds on it and try and pressure her on the whole, like, well, obviously if you're, if you're a scholarship kid, your family is concerned about money which means that it's probably difficult for you to pay for everything and you could use a card like this. And it's just one of those amazingly tone deaf arguments. I really appreciated that she was like, yeah, see, that is my background. And the fact that a bunch of kids from Aspen uh, or kids that can afford to vacation in Aspen all teamed up to try and sink my friend. That's why it makes me so mad. These dudes really think that like they can just buy her off and that she'll be fine with watching Weevil go to jail for some shit that they did. Like, guys, hello, read the room. What are you talking about? That said, when I was when I went to boarding school, I was given one of these cards at that school because we had like a um, sort of general store slash bookstore and I would buy snacks and stuff there and it was astonishing how fast that money went. And I wasn't like, I I have never been somebody who's wildly irresponsible with money. I have always been conscious of the fact that I'm spending, that I need to be careful. And that's not to say that I haven't made bad decisions or I haven't overspent, but I wasn't, you know, buying ridiculous shit. And it still went so fast. And I would have to ask for refills from my parents. And I knew that it could be really hard on them. And so I understand the appeal of having a card that has unlimited money on it. And uh, there's just, you can't, as one girl says, I can't just stop eating. You know, what are you supposed to do? Of course, she turns out to be a con artist, but whatever. Oh, Tori says she was on Heroes and Glee. Thank you, Tori. I think it's Glee that I remember her from. Um, so... They finally, because she's like, I could either tell my dad about what the fuck you did, or you can turn yourselves in. And they, she winds up convincing them by pretending that she taped the whole conversation on her phone, when in fact, she just taped the beginning of it on her shitty answering machine that only accepts like a 10 second message. But they hear enough of it to be fooled into thinking it's the whole conversation and that she can prove it. And that I really liked that. I thought that that was pretty clever that she like was able to bluff her way into pretending the whole thing was recorded. Um, And she gets Weevil out. And I really wanted to know, I don't know if it's actually mentioned now that I think about it. Once she gets Weevil out, does he get to get his job back and get the workman's comp for the thing? I really want to know if that like worked out for him. I can't remember because it was sort of overshadowed by the whole thing with Piz and Logan. Um, And yeah, Logan, when he shows up, he's like purple with rage and he just walks right into the studio 
and Dex Piz in the face multiple times. Like, it's really, it's quite a fight. He really goes to town. And there had been a scene earlier where Piz and Veronica and Logan and all of them are at the beach. And Logan gets really salty because he feels like there's a comment Piz makes that is implying I am a salt of the earth working man and you're just a frivolous rich boy, which like he gets very mad about. But I'm like, Logan, I hate to say this, dude, but that's exactly correct. Like you are. You've never shown any ambition or desire to do anything of substance ever. I don't know how to tell you, buddy, but you're getting mad because he hit a nerve because it's true. And that can happen, you know, just because you get mad at something doesn't mean you're mad because it's a lie. That's often not the reason, to be honest. Sometimes it's just some, you know, but so I can't help but wonder what Piz thinks is going on here. Does he think that Logan is here flipping out out of sheer jealousy because he finally realized and knowing I say knowing highly suspecting that Piz is not actually behind the distribution of this video. I can't imagine what is going to happen after this attack. Like this just looks really bad. Logan could get fucking expelled, probably will attacking somebody like this. And he was like in front of witnesses. There's no way to deny this happened. You know, I bet he does get expelled. I don't know what happens to Piz. I I just, ugh, it's a mess. Um, and there's one other like subplot that I want to mention, which is the whole thing with Dick. It's a wild thing. So again, it's just, it feels so late. There's so much of this season that feels like absolute filler. Like they didn't know what they were going to do. And then in this like second to last episode, they pull out some shit that I'm like, oh, well, this could be interesting. What are you doing? Why didn't you come up with this 10 episodes ago, 20 episodes ago? But Dick is really struggling with the way that he deals with his brother's death. And he asks Logan at one point, and Logan's like on the phone mid conversation with I'm imagining Parker. And he just is like, hey, Logan, did you try and stop my brother jumping off that building? Like, it's a total non sequitur. And it turns out he's drunk. Um, and he tells Logan about how one time he taped his brother's feet to his bike so that he and like left him out on the in the parking or on, on the driveway and went inside and forgot about him and came out hours later. And his brother was still like biking in circles because he couldn't get off the bike. And uh, he's just like, you know, all of these instances of cruelty and bullying that he's remembering and wondering if they contributed to his brother's death. And later on, when they're on the beach, he pulls Mac aside and apologizes to her for the way that he treated her and Beaver and is just like, look, the both of you were really smart. And I got the feeling you both thought I was really stupid, which I am. I mean, you know, I'm not as smart as you guys. And I lashed out because of that. But I treated you really shitty. And I'm, I'm sorry for it. And I also see what he saw in you. And I get it. And it's weird, because it's it, like, I, I totally understand Mac's perspective here. Whenever somebody has wronged you and they suddenly decide to apologize very formally, it can feel really like you're being put on the spot for something that you haven't even been given a chance to like process yet. And you feel like you're required to give forgiveness, even if you don't really feel forgiving about it. And, you know, she's just kind of like, no, it's fine. And, and so hurries away a little bit. But I... Like I said, I just wish this had happened a little bit earlier, that Dick had been faced with this stuff a little bit earlier. Um, Logan isn't rational is one of the writer's favorite plot devices, like Veronica being skeptical. Yeah, true. And Dick being a dick. Um, but yeah, so I'm I'm trying to think who else Dick can apologize to. I mean, he could definitely apologize to Veronica, God knows. Um, there's plenty of people that he's been really shitty to. But 
I don't really know at this point how much I care. I just wish that this had been dealt with a little bit earlier because it's just made me so squicky that Logan's still friends with him when he has been such a shady guy. So, so much time has passed that my heart has hardened and I want to be more interested than I am by now. Do you know what I mean? Um, Because, yeah, I feel like this could have been really good, and especially in the immediate aftermath of his brother's death. But I don't know. I don't know. I'm just really curious what the finale is going to be like now, because I I have no idea what they're doing. And that's, reminder, going to be a live watch Tuesday, May 4th. So, yeah, Tuesday next week. Um, And I'm going to watch that live at 5.30 p.m. Central Time. So if you want to come and hang out and watch me watch it, please do. And then we're going to do the recording for it on the 7th. And then the movie will be on the 21st. Um, I only have the first episode of season four booked on May 28th. I don't know if any others have been booked and just not entered into Crowdcast, but that's all I've got here for from what I can see. So um, anyway, I'm going to wrap up. Thank you again, Ariel, for commissioning this episode. Thank you to Tori for hanging out with me in the chat and giving me some info and stuff. I appreciate it. And I will be seeing you guys again soon with the finale live watch episode. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.